The story of Rome, one of the greatest empires of all time, starts far away from the Italian peninsula with a story of war and destruction. After the fall of Troy in Homer's mythical war, the gods ordered Aeneas to gather the survivors and find them a new home. On their way to Italy, the Trojans stopped at Carthage, where Aeneas seduced Carthaginian queen Dido. Upon seeing his fleet depart, Dido cursed his descendants and proclaimed endless hate between Carthage and the sons of Troy before committing suicide. After sowing the seeds of the Punic Wars, the Trojans continued on their way to Italy, where they landed in the territory of Laurentum. Only having their ships and their weapons, they started to plunder the land. Upon hearing the news of the invaders, King Latinus assembled an army and went to meet Aeneas in battle. Seeing the sorry state the Trojans were in, he invited them to a council. After hearing their story, Latinus offered his friendship and an alliance to Aeneas, which he accepted. The two leaders added a personal alliance to a public one when Aeneas married Lavinia, daughter of Latinus. This event marked the end of the Trojans' odyssey, after which they founded the city of Lavinium, named after Aeneas' wife. This alliance came as a surprise to Turnus, leader of the Rutuli, because Lavinia was promised to him. Angered by this, he led an assault on the joint force of Trojans and Laurentines. The outcome of this battle gave no joy to either side, as the Rutuli were defeated, but King Latinus was killed in the fighting. This left Aeneas as the sole leader of both factions. Turnus, weakened by this defeat, turned to the Etruscan city of Caere and King Mezentius. Fearful of the growing Trojan threat, he agreed to help Turnus and attack Aeneas. Wanting more cohesion in his army, Aeneas decided to unite the two tribes into a single people who he named Latins. With his final act, he secured victory and established the Tiber as the boundary between the Latins and the Etruscans. The city of Lavinium was becoming too small for the growing Latin population, so Ascanius, son of Aeneas, led his people east and founded the city of Alba Longa. Over the generations, the Latins grew in both number and strength, while kingship passed from father to son. These peaceful chances of power ended when King Numitor's younger brother Amulius seized the throne for himself, expelled Numitor and killed his son, while making his only daughter, Rhea Silvia, a Vestal Virgin, thus ensuring the line of Numitor had no heirs. But fate would have it that Rhea was raped and gave birth to twin boys. She claimed the act was done by Mars, the god of war, but this didn't save her nor her children from her uncle's wrath. Amulius imprisoned her and had the twins drowned in the Tiber. It just so happened that the river was overflowing at the time, and soldiers, unwilling to risk their lives, left the boys in one of the pools that formed along Tiber's banks. There a she-wolf found them and took care of them until a herdsman came along and saw the wolf gently licking the boys. He took the twins home, named them Romulus and Remus, and raised them with his wife as their own. Even the Romans acknowledge that this is just a fable, and Roman historian Livy gives us a possible explanation of its origin. As he states, the herdsman's wife was a prostitute named Lupa, meaning wolf, eventually giving rise to the she-wolf legend. The boys spent their youth roaming and hunting in the forest, and grew up to be strong and courageous men. They enjoyed fighting local brigands, and eventually took the fight to them. The twins would plunder their lands and split the spoils among the shepherds. The brigands, enraged by the loss of their loot, set up a trap and captured the twins. Romulus managed to escape, but Remus was taken to the local lord, who was no other than their grandfather Numitor. He realized the boys were his grandchildren, and the plot to return the king to his rightful throne was hatched. Romulus and Remus, each commanding one part of the army, reached the city and killed the usurper Amulius. Numitor reclaimed the throne of Alba Longa, and the twins decided to found a new city on the spot where they were left to drown. Both Romulus and Remus had the ambition to rule, but seniority could not settle this question, as they were twins. There are two versions of the events that unfolded. In the first version, they left the matter to the gods. While waiting for a sign, Romulus chose the Palatine and Remus the Aventine Hill. The omen appeared to Remus first. Six vultures landed on the Aventine. 
When this was proclaimed, twelve vultures landed on the Palatine. At this moment, both men declared themselves king, one side claiming priority of time and the other priority of number. In the fighting that ensued, Remus was killed. The other, more famous story states that Remus, mocking his brother, leaped over his half-finished wall. Enraged by this, Romulus killed Remus and proclaimed, So perish, whoever shall overleap my battlements. Either way, Romulus was left as the sole ruler of this new city which he named Rome. The legendary date of the founding of Rome is April 21, 753 BC. Romulus opened the gates to everyone, and so beggars, criminals, runaway slaves, and all other sorts of low life flocked to the city. Romulus formed the first legion from these new inhabitants. This legion consisted of 3,000 foot soldiers and 300 cavalry. In the early days of Rome, citizens had to equip themselves. This meant that only well-off citizens could serve in the military and only the rich could be in the cavalry. When the army was organized, Romulus devoted himself to the matters of state. He selected 100 men to form the Senate. This number was chosen because it was deemed sufficient or simply because there were only a hundred respectable people in the city. Their descendants would later be known as the Patricians, while the rest of the populace formed the plebeian class. For all its greatness, Rome didn't have any women and was destined to die out in a single generation. Following the Senate's advice, Romulus sent ambassadors to neighboring states and requested alliances and intermarriage rights for his subjects. Wherever the ambassadors went, they were rejected. This angered the Romans, so they decided to take the women by force. Romulus decided to hold the celebrations in honor of god Neptune as a ruse. No expense was spared in organizing and promoting this event. The trap worked, and a great number of people came to the city. While they were admiring the grand city and enjoying the festivities, Romulus gave the signal. The men were driven off and the women kidnapped. Most of the tribes mounted a quick assault on Rome but they were all repulsed. Only the Sabines waited for an opportune moment. When the time was right, they bribed the young girl who led them into the citadel. Romulus organized a defense, but neither army could gain an upper hand. Sabine women, seeing their fathers dying on one side and their husbands on the other, threw themselves between the armies. They pleaded with both sides to stop the fighting. Armies were moved by this sect, and an alliance was forged, ultimately uniting the Romans and the Sabines into a single nation. Romulus and King Titus Tatius were now co-rulers, and the hundred leading Sabines were added to the Senate, doubling its size to 200. After reorganizing the Senate, Romulus created the first citizen assembly, Comitia Curiata, by dividing the tribes into 30 curiae. Each curia had one collective vote, and they were tasked with electing various magistrates and enacting routine laws. It was also at this time that the legion was expanded to 6,000 men. For five years the two kings ruled together, until one day the relatives of King Titus attacked Laurentine ambassadors. When Titus visited Laurentum for a religious ceremony, he was murdered in an act of revenge. Romulus, undoubtedly happy to be the sole ruler once more, didn't do anything to avenge his death. Although Sabines were furious, they did not act, fearing Romulus's power. For 37 years, Rome was in a perpetual state of war. This all ended in 716 BC, when a great storm arose and Romulus, who was sitting on his throne, disappeared. We should stop this legend here and examine what little historical evidence we actually have. Latins were mostly pastoral people, living in tribal organizations. They were not skilled in arts and crafts, their culture showing a blend of Etruscan and Greek influences. An obvious example of this is the Roman pantheon, a simple adaptation of the Greek gods. What connected them was a common language, Latin, that was distinctly different from Etruscan to the north and Greek to the south. Etruscans were the dominant force in the area, both culturally and economically, and they developed cities long before the Latins did. The ancient historian Herodotus claimed that they migrated from Asia Minor, giving context to the story of Aeneas, but modern genetic evidence suggests otherwise. 
Archaeological evidence shows remains of an old settlement on the Palatine Hill, dating back to the 8th century BC. This supports the legendary date of foundation. However, it is unlikely that the location of the Eternal City was chosen because it marked the place where Romulus and Remus were left to drown. An easy river crossing, on a trade route connecting Etruria and Magna Grecia, protected by the surrounding hills, made this an ideal spot for an ancient city. After the death of Romulus, the crown passed from one man to another, until it reached a ruler so cruel that Romans swore a sacred oath, never again to let one man rule the city. Join us next time as we discuss the seven legendary kings of Rome and the overthrow of the monarchy.